Welcome back. Before, we were reading Luke's account of the Annunciation to Mary. Today, we're going to continue in chronological order by skipping over to Matthew's Gospel. We're going to read the Annunciation to St. Joseph. So let's dive in. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. The thing about Matthew's Gospel is he uses few words, and people have speculated endlessly about what exactly he meant. So it says, Mary was found with child by the Holy Spirit. Well, does that mean that the people finding her with child knew it was by the Holy Spirit? Or is Matthew just telling you, the reader, that it was by the Holy Spirit, but the other people on the ground at the time were clueless. We don't know. The next line says, Joseph was a righteous man and did not want to put her to shame, thus he would divorce her quietly. Well, what was his motivation exactly? Some people say Joseph knew Mary wouldn't commit adultery, and inferred therefore this had to be by the Holy Spirit. So, having realized God had claimed her in a special way, he decided to break it off with Mary, but quietly, so that no one would suspect foul play. Other people say Joseph wasn't sure what was going on. Did she commit adultery? Was there something worse going on? Either way, he knew this event, whatever caused it, scuttled the engagement. But he wished her no ill will, and didn't want her to come under the penalties of the law. So he did it quietly. Again, it would be nice to have Matthew here to ask him what exactly he meant by these words. Such was his intention, when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home. For it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This dreamlet message from the angel is why I personally believe Joseph was clueless regarding the cause of Mary's pregnancy. After all, the angel tells him it was of the Holy Spirit. Why tell him if he already knew? Anyway, I like the way the angel phrases the naming of Jesus. He says that he'll be named Jesus because he will save his people from his sins. Well, Jesus' name in Hebrew would have been Yahshua, or Yeshua, or Joshua, which literally means Yahweh saves. So the name here is meant to be descriptive, which is typical of ancient Hebrew society. Now, Matthew brings in the prophecy from Isaiah 7 concerning the virgin who will conceive. Again, this is another major point of controversy. Critics of Christian revelation will say that Matthew's use of this prophecy was illegitimate. They'll say this for two reasons. First, because the Hebrew word alma really means maiden, not virgin. So they'll say he's fudging the translation to make it sound like a prophecy for Jesus. Second, they'll point out this was supposed to be a sign for Hezekiah, in its original context in the 700s BC. On both counts, the critics are actually correct. But it doesn't mean that Matthew's use of this prophecy is illegitimate. Indeed, Alma does mean maiden, but the maiden is supposed to be a virgin in those cultures. The two concepts were synonymous. That's why the Greek Old Testament renders it as virgin. Second, the sign was also supposed to be for Hezekiah in the 700s BC. If you read on in the original, the prophecy doesn't stop with saying the virgin will conceive. It actually goes on at some length regarding the other details about the child and which were pertinent to the Hezekiah situation. But what often happens in biblical prophecy is that they have multiple fulfillments. You have one which happens immediately, followed by a greater one later on. For instance, King David is promised a son who will build a temple and reign forever. This was initially fulfilled in Solomon, who built the temple, but it was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Thus, the fulfillment of which Matthew points to is the greater fulfillment of the sign promised to Hezekiah, one which people wouldn't have necessarily known was coming. 
Now, we are just told that Christ's name was going to be Jesus, or Joshua. So what does it mean that Jesus' name was going to be Emmanuel? Well, the word name here is being used metaphorically, or even metaphysically. It describes the essence of who Jesus is, for he really is God with us. But it's not literally what Jesus' name was going to be. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. Many non-Catholics will bring up this passage as proof against the ancient Christian understanding of Mary as a perpetual virgin and Jesus as an only child. You can see where they get this. It says, He knew her not until she'd born a son. And similarly, if I said, I did not go outside until it stopped raining, you would automatically assume that I went outside after the rain had ceased. But consider how countless generations of Christians looked at this passage and came away undeterred in their conviction that Mary had no other children. Did they know something we didn't? Well, the Greek word heos can rightly be rendered as until or till. But if you look at all the uses of the phrase, you'll see it being used in other ways too, such as when it refers to going down to the bottom of a pit, or when Jesus says, uh, uses the word to say, how long? Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but looking at a survey of the uses of this word, it indicates a concept of length or proceeding to an extent, but it doesn't always indicate a reversal of a condition after that length is met. One example is when Paul tells Timothy to continue reading the scriptures until he arrives. Naturally, he doesn't want the scriptures to be stopped after he arrives. Or Jesus says, I will be with you until the end of the age. Okay, that doesn't mean Jesus is going to stop being with them after the end of the age. In some instances, the word until does not mean a reversal of, of, the, uh, of the condition at hand. Such is the case here. Matthew is telling us that Joseph did not have intercourse with Mary any time prior to the birth of Jesus. He's not trying to tell them about their sex life and what happened afterward. All right, and with that, we'll draw to a close. Next time, we'll look at Luke's account of Christ's birth. See you then.